Thank you for joining us for this exciting event. Uh, we expect a great audience or for our Space Cafe web talk today. We also appreciate your ongoing feedback. Here we are. I'm Thorsten Kreening, your host today and co-publisher of Spacewatch.global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I hope many of you already know our website, our bi-weekly newsletter, our daily newsletters, our Space Cafe podcast, and our web talks. If you missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our web page in the event section. We host our Space Cafe web talks on a weekly base. This is already the seventh edition. I hope you mark Tuesdays at the same time in your calendar already. Let's do some housekeeping. Just to let you know, we are recording this webinar session and we will make it available on spacewatch.global in a few days. We are also streaming Space Cafe live on Facebook. If you would like to ask a question, just use the Q&A section on the lower end of the Zoom webinar screen as shown here, not the chat, and there is also no need to raise your hand. If you hit the Q&A tab, you will be able to type your question and send it over to us. Or you can also vote for questions. If we don't get your question or during the session, we will try to follow up with you later to offer an answer. We can guarantee that our guests will answer all your questions, but we will um, answer as many as possible. Today, we are getting very technically technical. My guest today is on the forefront of the development of small sets, small, air, uh, small spacecraft. I'm proud to welcome Professor Dr. René Laufer. Let me offer a, a very brief introduction of his fascinating career. As I mentioned last week too, I know many of you in the audience are in the beginning of your careers and you are looking for a smart way into the space industry. René was born and grew grew up in Berlin, Germany. Why do I say that? We are in Berliner and we are proud to be Berliners. He worked at the German Aerospace Center, DLR, Berlin Adlershof in the field of planetary exploration. From 2003, he was a research associate, lecturer and staff member of the Institute of Space Systems at the University Stuttgart in Germany, involved in various research and teaching activities. He was teaching at the International Space University in France, in Spain, and in the US. Since 2009, René has been a research faculty member at CASPAR. CASPAR is the Center of Astrophysics, Space Physics, and Engineering Research at Baylor University in Texas, and head of the Space Science Lab. He is also a visiting scientist and visiting faculty at many other universities. He is a member of the International Academy of Astronautics and a co-chair of the IAA's Permanent Committee on Small Satellite Missions. Today, he is connected to us from Berlin. Thank you, René, for being my guest. Please tell us about the, uh, please tell us about the outlook of, for small sets for the future. At least I'm very excited about to hear that, and I've seen your fascinating slides already. So the audience is yours, René. Over to you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. Pleasure to be here, especially in a month like this with uh, rock stars like Frank Salzgeber last week and uh, Vera next week and Kai Uwe then in two weeks. I feel a little bit small here and uh, with all these big institutions. So let's talk about small satellites or as my late mentor Hans-Peter Röser used to call them technology miracle boxes. So next slide, please. Let me remind you before we dig into this deeper that it all started with small satellites. So if you're part of this community building student satellites or with a commercial startup building uh, nano satellites for commercial purposes or if you're with a research institution, be proud of it because we didn't start a fire as Billy Joel used to say, but the space age started with us, so we were part of it. And if you continue this legacy of firsts and milestones like Sputnik 1 
or uh, first communication and weather satellites, or even the first privately funded satellite in 1965, Oscar III, then you're part of this continuance of the success of small satellites for more than 60 years now. Next slide, please. So let's have a look a little bit about small satellite versus large satellites. And thanks to this diagram from my colleagues, Rainer Sandau, Klaus Bries, and Mark Vierico, let me explain a little bit where this all leads. Of course, you are mostly familiar, or most of you will be familiar with the distinction and the classes and the categories of small satellites, be it picosatellites less than a kilogram or nanosatellites less than 10 kilogram or microsatellites less than 100 kilograms compared to what we call the big birds like NVSAT or the big communication satellites in geostationary orbit. Of course, all these limits were done to classify and were uh, initiated to classify these satellites. And more and more we see that there is crossovers between these limits. Sure, with CubeSats for almost 20 years now, first launched uh, 17 years ago with CubeSats, a one unit can be up to 1.33 kilogram. Still, let's call this a Pico satellite. But with growing nano satellites beyond the 3U range, or even the much more common, soon to be common now 6U range, we enter the region beyond 10 kilogram, but you mainly built with CubeSat technologies, CubeSat nanotechnologies that are in the form factor, basically using all the technology which fits into one U more or less. So while these are basically small microsatellites, from the philosophy and from design, they are more or less still nanosatellites. And even the microsatellites are starting to grow or started to grow for some time now. While the dimensions and the envelope that is provided with launch vehicles are not growing, certainly, the mass that can be launched with a mounting point, with a mounting adapter for auxiliary payloads with all the launch vehicles or most launch vehicles um, are providing more and more mass. So while traditionally this started with 50 kilogram and went towards 100 kilogram, we see more and more auxiliary payload opportunities in the 120 to even 180 kilogram range. We should not forget the end of the day, if you have an outer envelope, if you have the dimensions of a microsatellite, then it's basically up to you and if you can handle uh, more payloads. So if you have more mass, why not put more cool stuff into your magical miracle box and launch it into space? And I'm sure this tendency will increase in future because most established launch vehicles basically provide enhanced version, XL versions, more boosters or so so on. So I'm sure we will get closer to the 200 kilogram or even a little bit more, even if it's still mainly a microsatellite envelope. So while these uh, cost and time numbers are certainly flexible, they are only a guidance, what I want to demonstrate with this uh, diagram is that, of course, you can spend a little bit for a Pico satellite of one kilogram, and you can do it in less than one year, but what we have seen in the past few years, and what I'm sure we will see more and more, is that payloads become more and more sophisticated while more and more miniaturized. And that means we will see basically a shift to software and sophisticated payload hardware. And that means often, even with today's examples, the payload has a larger cost fraction of your project than the remaining satellite bus. And I think that's important to keep that in mind when you think about small satellites. So next slide, please. So the things I'm talking today are mostly from the perspective of my role within the International Academy of Astronautics. The Academy is on the forefront of small satellites from the very beginning. At a point when I rem remember my colleague, dear colleague Rainer Sander used to say, when uh, all the serious satellite guys used to call small satellites toys and try to send us back to the sandbox and to the playground to play with our toys. So what have we seen in the, um, especially the past 20 to 30 years? Everybody knows there's an increase in number of spacecraft and the majority of spacecraft launched, especially in very recent years, are small satellites, often nano or pico satellites. There's an increase in the number of spacefaring nations. 
uh, we had 40 spacefaring nations until 2000. We had more than double this in the, uh, in the past decade. And we are close to 100. So maybe we reach the 100 end of this year or maybe beginning of 2021. And it's, it's no prophecy to say that uh, within another decay, decade, probably all countries uh, that are sitting in the United Nations are probably having set their own satellite. Because small satellites, especially Pico Nano satellites, are lowering the entry barrier to space. That is a fact. Taking especially the last one and a half decades into account, we have seen that the reduction in size that was in the beginning the main factor from the micro and mini satellites of the 80s to the micro satellites and smaller micro satellites in the 90s to the reduction in size by another kind of, yeah, not order of magnitude, by, by a new philosophy, the CubeSats, that uh, with all these one new CubeSats, we see in the recent years an increase in mass and size again. Of course, that has to do with available launch opportunities, more mass, it's more possible to build bigger, small satellites, but also people realize the limitations. In example, the science return from scientific missions, because at the end of the day, a one unit CubeSat is very, very limited in what you can do with your payload, how much space and how much mass is left for your payload. Overall, we can say that small satellites are not always in competition with big birds anymore, but especially in the commercial field, they are becoming the big competitors, but overall it's important they are taken seriously. So next slide. Next slide, please. So what are the opportunities we will see in future? And you can go through the list when you see the slides then on the Space Force Global website. I think we will see more small satellites, especially in the area of scientific missions. As uh, former NASA Administrator Mike Griffin said, exploration is where microsatellites, and I would like to add nano and pico satellites, will hit their home run. Of course, baseball energy is very US, so let's say it's every favorite sport you have. So small satellites, due to their low cost, are perfect for high-risk missions. So take a lot of them with you to your preferred target and do a short duration mission. Let them basically die after a short mission duration, but get valuable data, which you would never risk your big satellite doing that. Or build large networks or build uh, constellations of small satellites, not only beyond low Earth orbit, but even in interplanetary space. Next slide, please. Let's think about a few thoughts on future trends. So what we observed and what we will think we will see the next 10 to 15 years is what I call don't stop me now. Don't remain in established models. I think in past uh, uh, Space Cafe talks here with Space Watch Global, we heard, uh, we heard already in the economic area that some people said investors currently like to invest in copies of established small satellite startups because that provides some proof that's a good idea. Of course, we see more than a hundred, or we saw before the corona pandemic started, we saw more than 130 <coughs> proposals for commercial uh, communication and earth observation startups. We all know not all of them will survive. So make more studies, come up with more out of the box ideas to invent and develop new crazy ideas where small satellites are perfect for trying if you have success and make it a mission. Ask for a ride because flight opportunities are increasing. So talk to your space agency, talk to partners. Shall we dance? Small satellite uh, development showed very, very much that uh, international collaboration and collaboration beyond startups into academia with government institutions can have a lot of benefits. Next slide, please. Don't become a fashion victim. Cubes are not the only solution to all mission designs, even if they are very much favorites of everyone because they lower the entry barrier so much and they're easy to do. Think about capability-driven mission designs. Think what you can do and then look into the form factor that can solve it. Do one thing well. My favorite Unix motto of my time at the university 
Small satellites are perfect for that. Of course, you won't fit probably 13 payloads into a small satellite, but do one thing well and you will succeed. Use the power, not of the force. We just had May the 4th, and May the 4th be with you all over the globe. But use the power of the onboard computer. Because even in small satellites, especially with CubeSat technologies, we have already computer performance available that was out of reach 10 years ago, 15 years ago, even with bigger satellites. And many things are easier to solve with software than hardware. Next slide. Come together. Strong university programs are no threat to other parts. We had these discussions in the last decades. Universities should not build their own small satellites. That should be done by companies. No, bridge the gap and collaborate. We have seen many success models all over the world where collaboration, academia, government, commercial partners succeed in providing and creating and building a bigger market. Let's mix it up, combine elements. Maybe like in Earth observation, you might even mix it up with elements in space and airborne elements and ground elements. The same can be said for other uh, places in the solar system where you want to have UAVs, balloons, and whatever. And my favorite, because uh, I like to call it the TIE fighter effect, outnumber your investigated subject. If you can solve your problem with uh, not with one satellite, small satellites are perfect, take 10 or 50 or 100. One more slide, and then let's go to the questions. Next slide, please. About a decade ago, this is what one nice colleague of mine Im imagined in an irony way how the microsatellite of 2020 would look like. Well, we haven't reached that. It's not our MIRBA size, and we still don't have a time travel flux capacitor in our small satellites. But we are successfully miniaturizing, especially payloads. And I think it's important that we go further down that road, even if there will always be room for different size satellites. With that, let's go forward and uh, questions, answers, and also some interactive part on your side. Thorsten, back to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. It's always a pleasure to have an, uh, a professor talking uh, or forced to talk very shortly about our, a bunch of slides. So, what we prepared for you today are first time and i hope that will work is a poll um which i'm sending out now so um we would like to ask you and uh, renee maybe you can uh, go into these details here please so just to make it a little bit more interactive we would like to know what do you think what type of small satellite missions will we see the next 15 years something exciting like weird or fancy in space manufacturing of small satellites or even missions to different parts of the solar system, even maybe the outer solar system, will small satellites go there? So click your preferred answer and then submit. And I think we will collect the results and probably will uh, discuss them also together with the, all the written answered question then with the, uh, with the uh, email in a few days. Absolutely. So, um, before we taking questions from uh, the uh, the audience, let me start with um, with one that our uh, yeah also was was raised uh, from the audience, and it's the um, end of missions or or disposal. So, um, John and many others ask, um, what are the best way of safely and responsibly disposing of small satellite once they have reached the end of the operational lifetime? How can such measures be enforced and made in, in international norm? And I think that's something what we discussed on, on space traffic management on the UN level and, and so on. So maybe you can give your view on that. Excellent question. And the International Academy of Astronautics just released a guidebook because of this issue. We know our community all over the world and together with UNICEF Global, uh, the IAA uh, did a one-year study with experts in their field from all over the world, uh, led by Darren McKnight and contributing contributions by many other experts from all over the world into a guidebook for safe disposal for satellites 100 kilogram and less it was uh, issued and released last year. It's available for free, the first time, for free, uh, available on the IAA website. And I think we might just put the link then into the email to everyone that they can download it. 
as a collaboration was presented last year at UN Copus. And that gives at least what is the current state of the art, what you should plan for your disposal of your small satellite. Uh, what you should you take care of? What risk analysis should you do when you plan your CubeSat or your nano satellite? And in most of the cases, you will be fine. Of course, when it comes to the enforcing, that's not so much my area. Uh, that's probably a question more for Kai Wischroge in two weeks when it comes to the law point. Law point. Keep it in mind. But uh, I think uh, uh, what we like to see is more code of conduct, more best practice done by everyone. I think then we already will increase the number uh, of successful disposal of small satellites if, if everybody is more and more following these guidelines. Great. So an another one, so more nations are starting space programs and more nations are using small satellites or for boosting their, their programs. What are the challenges in terms of the outer space treaty, satellite registration, radio frequency coordination, planetary protection? So or space traffic management, behaviors in space, and, and so on. So from your point of view, um, what are the big challenges on that area? First of all, I see the Outer Space Treaty as an enabler. It allows the free exploration and the use of space. Of course, my space legal friends will have a very detailed interpretation of the use of space. But first of all, it allows and it enables that especially more and more nations are interested to put satellites into space, to make good use of space, to do scientific exploration in space. When it comes to the hurdles, of course, frequency allocation, long waiting times, if you want to use um, high frequencies for high data bandwidth is certainly an issue. It might take a while to get that done for your satellite. It's probably not so easy if you're a, small, a startup or if you're a small academic institution. So ask your beloved space agency to help you ask your governmental partners to help you, maybe ask international collaborators to help you if they have experience. When it comes to space traffic management, I think that's an issue that uh, is something we all have to deal with. And again, I hope for best practices and code of conduct because it might be hard to enforce uh, because we, we can and we should not prevent new spacefaring nations to enter that club. Okay, um, so we, we asked this question or about the next 15 years deliberately. So small satellites in the future are um, cislunar interplanetary missions. Where are the limits? And I'm closing this poll now. We had uh, 53 or so 75% are answered. I think that can be called representative. So, and I tried to share the results. Yeah. So and maybe uh, while answering this question, you can um, get these results into that as well. So where are the limits on small satellite missions? It might be old fashioned, but in our business, it's perfect. Literally, the sky is the limit. Um, so when we see here infrastructure and constellation at Moon and Mars, I think that's the perfect starting point for uh, future planetary small satellites. In addition to dedicated science missions, to support future exploration, even human exploration with small satellites. Where's the limit? Of course, miniaturization is going on, so it will be easier to put smaller payloads into more small satellites, to have networks of science, network of scientific satellites with network of payloads. Some people uh, um, advocate very much federated and fractionated satellites, so we might even see a mix of free-floating chipsets and payloads. Where's the limit in terms of what people can achieve? Well, with more flight opportunity, again, I think if you're willing to build a small satellite, if you're willing to do that, and especially if you want to go into exploration with your small satellite, then you should do that. So I hope very much, and I'm happy that the audience is uh, joining me in this. I'm very much looking forward in the next 10 to 15 years to see infrastructure at the moon and on Mars, hopefully supporting the return of humans to the moon and maybe for the first steps of a human on Mars. Great. And we will find out who wears a tree that clicked none of the above. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'm stopping that here. Our next question are, how does the demand for small satellite launch vehicles grow in the coming de uh, decade? Because there are about 100 small 
satellite launch vehicle programs under development, does the market is getting overcrowded? That's a question from Gokul Ravi. Yeah. Well, I think similar to all these proposed small satellite constellations or constellations at all, most of them are small satellite constellations. Uh, I'm sure you have seen there are many more than 50 proposed or as you said, even 100 proposed uh, uh, launcher developments. I think my economic uh, space economy friends would say the market probably will sort that out. I'm sure we will not see all these uh, companies and startups succeeding in building a, a small launcher or a micro launcher. At the end of the day, we probably will only have a handful of companies addressing that. I'm still very much convinced that we will see an increase in launch opportunities. We see this already. We will see an increase in launch opportunities for small satellites and especially in lower cost launch opportunities. I'm sure we will not see a hundred more launch vehicles. There's probably not a market for that. And uh, if a handful of this survives and succeeds, I'm fine with that. I'm pretty sure the demand will still be enough to make good business uh, for all these new uh, surviving companies. What is a low point or what is an, um, a measure or a, a low value measure for uh, cost uh, for access to space? So what will a 10 kilo CubeSat cost me? Or a ki you know, kilo you know, price? It's, it's, it's an interesting question. Your glass ball. Yeah, because from yes. most of the proposals we have seen in recent years, the promise is to significantly lower the launch cost, but when you look at the prices we hear about, they are no real price lists often, but when you hear about on conferences about the prices that are offered, this is not an order of magnitude less. It's often just slightly lower. So at the end of the day, I think you can't beat physics. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I hope that we get down to a few thousand dollar in the, in the midterm duration, in the midterm duration, maybe for a decade to a few thousand dollars uh, per kilogram from the more than 5,000 and uh, the 10,000 or more than we, th what we had. So that would be already a good step forward because that makes it achievable, much more achievable for many players to even place a small nano satellite into space. I wouldn't say, uh, I don't have my crystal ball with me. I wouldn't say we will reach less than a thousand dollars in a decade but I'm optimistic that we can lower this to a few thousand dollars in the decade. Okay, fair enough. Um, there are two more questions I would like to uh, um, go through with you with um, a request for a very short answer. Okay. So Anna asks, what are the applications you think will drive this small set market? I think a very interesting one. I mean, in the market, sure, we need uh, the companies or the players need to make money. So currently we see communication and earth observation as a, as, a, as a prime topic. And of course, earth observation is such a wide range from uh, people want to know when the, uh, uh, ice, the ice shelf is breaking and they can start shipping again to uh, please find me a parking spot in the downtown Los Angeles. So this is a wide range. So I think this will drive in addition with navigation, but for that you need larger satellites. This will drive the commercial part. In all other areas, it's the science. Can I put my experiment that is sitting in my laboratory, can I miniaturize it so much that I could put it in a satellite and launch it into space? Be it astronomy, mm -hmm. be it basic science, be it planetary exploration. These are the drivers. Okay, great. And the last one, let's see if we, we can make two, two more out of that. Can you envision a time when all sm satellites are small satellites? So <laughs> what would need to happen technologically for that to ever uh, occur? I don't want to hurt my friends who are still happy to build big satellites. And I always see room for big birds. Uh, at the end of the day, if we want to place rovers, robotic rovers on the surface of Europa, if we want to do sample return from Enceladus uh, or something like this, you can't do this with a CubeSat. But I see, a, I see the tendency, and this will continue, what we have seen in recent years, that more and more small satellites are built and um, are be the majority of the satellites launched into space. There's always room for certain payloads that need a big satellite, 
as I said, you can't beat physics and you can't put a Hubble Space Telescope, uh, telescope into a CubeSat. But I would say, yes, we will see more and more small satellites. And, you know, in Star Trek terminology, maybe the CubeSats and the NanoSats and the microsatellites become the standard type 7 probe you always see in Star Trek launched when they are at an M-class planet to get some information about that planet. God, you are such a geek. <laughs> yes. Um, we have a number of questions or I, I see on the Q&A and they're about standardization and the large pain points. So um, we will send them over to Rene um, and hope that he will ask, uh, answer them uh, in the next day. So latest by Friday, I can promise that uh, you will receive an email with our, um, all the answers in. Cool. So unfortunately, our, the time is up already. Um, I'm afraid we have to come to an end even so, I mean, I, would really enjoy continuing this talk with you. But are all of you be sure that we will follow up on the small satellite or um, development topic in our Space Cafe web talks from time to time and of course in our magazine. So with that, or I would like to have the next slide please, or because the announcement is now what are our next webinars. So next week um, we will have uh, the wonderful uh, Vera Pinto from the European Commission talking with me about how can space help inclusion and promote equality. On the 26th of May, I will discuss with Professor Dr. Kai Beschrogel, and you mentioned him a few times, the president of the IISL, or his thoughts on space law for the future, and because that's what we need. Uh, we are getting really a lot of bookings already for that event. So if you're interested, get your seats or as fast as possible because also our tickets are limited at one stage. And as a first hand announcement here on the 2nd of June, I call Dr. Raji Raja Gopalan, distinguished, distinguished, okay. She's fellow and head of the Nuclear and Space Policy Initiative at the Observer Research Research Foundation in New Delhi, India, my guest. Raji will give us a briefing on the national security dynamics in India's space program for those that are interested about that. All events are online on Eventbrite and I discovered today on Eventbrite, if you have seen a few of our events, then you know, or I, at least I got an email from Eventbrite telling me, hey, here's a new event coming up from Space Watch Global, which is pretty cool. As always, we would like to hear your feedback, so please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you're able and interested to sponsor our upcoming 50-page SOAR Group e-brief of perspective from the international space expert on the executive order of President Trump, please let us know. We need your support also as a potential sponsor for these web talks here. Thank you all very much for your interest today on this technical and forward-looking topic. Thank you, Rene, for being my guest. It was a pleasure to have you here. And thanks again to my entire team behind the scenes for doing that great job week by week. Again, I hope um, all of you stay well and stay healthy. Thank you for joining us and I hope to see you next week. In the meantime, just visit our website or reach out to us. We are looking to hear from you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>